Okay, let's start. So welcome everybody after the lunch break. And next talk is, uh, is by Guillermo Perez, who is uh, assistant professor in the University of Antwerp. And Guillermo will tell us about synthesis for one counters. So please. Thank you, Wojtek. Um, in particular, thanks for pronouncing my name correctly. It's been ages since I heard it like that. <laughs> so this will be about uh, parameter synthesis. Let me see if this writes. Yeah, parameter synthesis problems for one counter automata. And um, the, the kind of problems is just reachability problems. And uh, the reason there's parameters here, it's because the one counter automata will be parametric. And the questions will be regarding the values and whether we can reach some, uh, some particular states. So this is based on, uh, on ongoing work with my PhD su student Ritam, who actually made the slides. I just copy pasted them. Um, and uh, we had earlier submitted a uh, uh, draft of this to concur, but it was thankfully rejected. And I say thankfully because the day after we got the rejection notice, we, we found a problem with one of the proofs. So my idea for today is to tell you about uh, the model, uh, the parametric one counter automata, the problems that we were, that we're studying. I'll tell you about why um, the problem that we're considering was previously thought to be already um, solved or why it was thought to be decidable already and why that approach doesn't actually work. Then I'll tell you about how you can solve uh, the reachability problem when you consider a subclass of uh, parametric one counter automata. And then I'll just briefly mention why uh, the approach we tried is actually not going to work if you consider games. So uh, that would just be um, rather quick. Okay, so to confuse you a bit, uh, if you remember the, um, the talk by Stavik, I'm going to go from programs to automata instead of the other way around. So let's consider this, uh, this piece of code, which I'm going to call a simple counter program. And this is a simple counter program because its control flow is actually dictated by the value of a single counter. So in this case, that's the variable n which is initialized to five, and then I'm going to subtract from it uh, five. And this is guarded with this maximum, uh, the idea being that uh, n cannot take negative values. So I take the maximum uh, between zero and the value that you obtain so that uh, if it's a negative value, you, you just go back to zero. And then the rest of the program goes, um, um, goes into this uh, body of the if, or it goes into the else, depending on, on whether n is zero and then this, cycle again does a number of increments based on the, the value of n and finally we could get to this point which is uh, a good thing because here we actually make some progress so we would like to hit this point in the program so this you can actually model with the one counter automaton in this case i am going to look at um, uh, equality tests so it's not just a one counter net and uh, I'm not going to have uh, letters, so I'm not going to have an alphabet. I just want uh, the transitions of the automaton to have uh, updates or tests. And if you see here, um, already in my example, this thing uh, models the initialization by five, then you do the decrement by five, then if you're zero, just like in this line, you go into this state where you can do this increment by one, and then if you're already greater than or equal to 10, you can continue. And after doing this increment by 100, you get to this uh, part of the code, which is good. So this is what we would like to happen. So without going into too much details, uh, configurations in the one counter automaton are just a pair of states and uh, the counter value. And I'm going to suppose that we are interested only in, in non-negative counter values. So this is a one counter automaton, but the kind of programs that I, I would like to look at are uh, places where you actually have parameters. And this arises when you have the same code, but you have it inside a function. And this function has as a parameter, say, x. And now you have the same piece of code, but instead of subtracting by 5, I'm doing a subtraction by, by x here. So the same uh, question is valid. Is it the case that we can reach this, uh, this, um, this nice line or this uh, nice snippet? Because this is where we make progress. But now, since we have a parameter, we have to ask, do we existentially quantify the values of the parameter or do we universally quantify the values of the parameter? 
But before going to the question, you can actually again capture the behavior of this, uh, of this program using a one counter automaton. But in this case, instead of subtracting by a constant, I'm going to subtract by a, by a parameter. So I'm going to have this variable x, which I subtract by, and then the rest is the same. So you have the same counter automaton, but you have updates which are parametric. So this is more or less what I'm going to focus on, parametric one counter automaton. And in general, I have a, a set of variables I can do on my parametric, on uh, the one counter automaton, things like minus x1 plus x3. I could do lower bound tests like greater than or equal to x2, but you can also have constants and you can have zero tests. If you want to be slightly more formal, then a parametric one counter automaton is just a set of states, an initial state. You have a set of transitions. And you label with these transitions with operations from uh, the following types. So you can have uh, constant updates. You can have um, constant tests. But you can also have parametric updates or parametric tests. And notice that I don't have upper bounds. It's just uh, lower bound tests and equality tests. If you don't have variables, then we fall back to the uh, first model I gave you, which is the non-parametric one counter automaton. And the reason there's this word succinct here is because I'm going to assume that all the constants are given in binary. All right. So that's the model. And to confuse you further in this talk, I'm actually going to consider a few subclasses of, of this model. This is the, uh, the model in full generality that I just defined. Um, if you don't have any parameters, then you obtain succinct one counter automata, no parameters. So you see that uh, there are no parametric updates. There are no parametric tests. If we restrict the updates to be unary and constant only, so you have constant updates that are uh, minus one, zero, and one, and you don't have any parametric updates, then you obtain this class that I'm going to call OCAPT, which is impossible to pronounce any other way. So OCAPT. All right, so that's the model. Oh, uh, sorry, there is a question. Yeah. Uh, whether a model is deterministic. Um, no, so I'm not going to assume it is deterministic, despite the fact that in my example, it, you obtain uh, counter automata that are deterministic. And one short question, you can, uh, you can model these tests that you are above A by dropping by A and increasing by A, yeah? Yes, so this is why in this table, I am considering I, I write here zero tests instead of constant tests, because um, for SOCA and SOCAP, if you would like to check, uh, say, if you have a transition of this kind, then you can always replace it by going from Q to some new state, uh, doing minus A. Then you do an equals to zero, and on the other side, you do plus A, right? And so lower, bound, lower bound tests as well, yeah? Yes, for lower bounds, you, you could do the same. So you can, uh, you can restrict to, to zero. It is slightly trickier for OCAPT because uh, of this uh, unary uh, business, because mm -hmm. I am only restricting the, the updates to be unary, not the tests. Oh. Another question by uh, S. Guha. Why don't you consider upper bound, upper bound tests probably? Um, because um, it makes things more complicated and most questions are still open regarding upper bounds, if you have parameters. And this is uh, related to open problems by Oscar Ibarra. And uh, yeah, the reason I mentioned simple programs in the beginning is because there's a, uh, a long-standing open problem regarding a formalization of simple programs. And this comes in when you have upper and lower bounds. If you only have lower bounds, then I'll, I'll show you a trick which seems to solve most of the problems. Are there other questions on the model? Okay. Um, so that's it for the model. Let me just uh, give you, I'll, I'll try to keep this slide always as a summary of the decision problems that we're considering. So let's start with the non-parametric model. If we have one counter automata, no parameters anywhere, then the most natural question is, um, you can ask is reachability. Does there exist a run such that from the initial configuration, so that's the initial state and zero value for the counter, you reach some final state. And notice that I'm asking control state reachability, but because we have this um, equality test, this is actually equivalent to, to asking to configuration reachability. So it's just uh, to write it in a easier way here. 
So we know that this problem is uh, NP complete. I think uh, Patrick actually also mentioned this. This is due to Christoph Hasse and uh, co-authors. And, um, and uh, if you add parameters, and you ask, does there exist a value for the parameters such that there exists a reaching run? Then this is also known to be decidable. It's actually, it was actually shown to be decidable in the same paper by Christoph. And um, the upper bound is due to the fact that to obtain decidability, they reduced the problem to a satisfiability question in a Pressburg arithmetic with uh, divisibility, but where you don't have a quantifier alternation. So you have a quantifier free formula of, the, of this logic and then uh, you ask satisfiability. And so the, uh, the uh, satisfiability problem for the logic was, was established here to be in non-deterministic exponential time. And here it's perhaps the best point to, to come back to this question about upper bounds. The fact that you can encode reachability into, um, into, uh, into a formula in this logic does not work for, uh, or does not seem to work as easily for uh, when you have upper bounds. So that, that is completely broken. All right, uh, now for the non-parametric case, if we go back to the example that I gave you earlier, what I'm actually interested in is uh, no matter what, making progress or universal lightness. So it would be more interesting to actually ask, is it true that for all infinite uh, runs or for all infinite executions in your program, you make some progress or you reach some, uh, some uh, accepting state? I'm going to call this problem universal reachability. And then um, the related question for the parametric case is, uh, does there exist evaluation for the, for the parameters such that for all infinite runs of the counter automaton, you actually reach the final state? And these are the two problems that I'm going to focus on. So let's try and think a bit about uh, the first problem, brainstorm about how we would be able to solve it. I think, in fact, most of uh, the main idea was already present in Patrick's talk. Um, so let me just uh, recall the, the model. In this model, we have constant updates and we have zero tests. We don't have parameters at all. And we're asking the universal reachability problem. So is it true that all infinite paths reach some accepting state? So it's not easy to see that the complement of this is just uh, there exists an infinite path that avoids QF at, an, at all points in time. And it turns out that uh, if such a path exists, then there is a path which uh, looks more or less like this. Um, so, well, actually there's two possibilities. So it will reach a cycle which either contains a zero test and then it stays in this cycle forever, avoiding QF, or it reaches a cycle which it can pump and it doesn't have uh, any, uh, any zero tests. And by pumping, it's not necessarily that it takes uh, values that go to infinity, but you can just take it forever. And so you can guess which one of these two things holds and uh, you can ask two reachability queries to ask if this is true. And because we know that reachability is in NP, then that means that our original problem is in co-NP. You can actually get uh, hardness as well by reduction from uh, the complement of uh, subset sum. And this is a very simple reduction. You just take the, the classical um, subset sum reduction to reachability in, in counter automata and you change two states essentially. And that works out. All right, so the universal reachability problem seems to be co-NP complete. And we will use it as, a, as an ingredient in, in one of the next slides. So remember that thing. Now, the main question we are interested in here is does there ex the synthesis reachability problem. Does there exist a value such that for all infinite runs, we actually reach an accepting state? And I'm going to summarize more or less what was the previous approach and uh, tell you why it doesn't work, unfortunately. And then I'm going to move to how you can solve it if you have a restricted subclass of the model. So let's start with the previous approach. Um, so I mentioned that uh, for the existential case of reachability in parametric one counter automata, you can reduce this thing to formulas in, pre in some extension of Pressburger arithmetic. So to recall, Pressburger arithmetic is the first order theory over this structure. The extension that is used in the paper by Christoph is uh, Pressburger arithmetic with divisibility. So you extend this with a divisibility predicate, which just says, well, there exists some, some number that you can multiply the left-hand side so that you obtain the, the right-hand side. 
Now, unfortunately, this logic in full generality, if you allow all craziness of uh, quantifier alternation, this is undecidable. And in fact, one alternation already suffices to get undecidability because you can define multiplication and then you can encode the uh, Hilbert's 10th uh, problem, essentially. Fortunately, the existential fragment is not to be decidable because of Lipschitz. And uh, in this very nice paper by uh, Antonia Lechner, um, Joel Wagner and James Worrell, it was shown that, uh, that, uh, it, that they revisited the proof of Lipschitz and it, it, they show that it's not only decidable, but it's decidable in non-deterministic exponential time. So it's tempting to leverage this approach to try and solve this problem, this synthesis reachability problem in which you have a single alternation, right? Seems like you would want to do some uh, small modifications of the translation from the parametric one counter automaton to the logic and try to recover some, uh, some decidability that way. And this is precisely what uh, previous attempts had focused on. So there is this logic called AE, AER pad, or however you want to read that in your head. The idea here is that you have a single alternation. Uh, you have uh, variables that are quantified uh, universally, variables that are quantified existentially, and then you have a quantifier-free Pressburger arithmetic formula with visibility. Now, in general, I said one alternation is just enough to get on this ability, so we have to restrict this further if we actually want to do something. And the restriction that seemed the more natural for previous authors is the following. So any divisibility that occurs inside phi has to be of the following form. So on the left-hand side, you have a linear function on Z only. So only on the things that are universally quantified. And on the right-hand side, you can have X if you want. So the things that are existentially quantified. And this is why there's the R uh, telling you that uh, uh, the existentially quantified variables can appear on the right. Now, um, um, there's a subfragment of this in which essentially, if you reduce the formula to negation normal form, I don't want the divisibilities to appear negated. So this is why there's the plus, um, divisibilities should always appear in a positive way. Sorry, uh, when Sam asks, uh, what does the R stands for? The R below the exis exists yeah. uh, stands for right. So the variables that are existentially quantified can be used on the right-hand side of the visibilities. Okay. So I, uh, there seems to be another question. It's really hard to see the chat when you're looking at the screen. It was just thanks. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I was saying there's this positive fragment of AER pad, um, which uh, thankfully, or after some reworking of uh, the translation from parametric one counter automata to, um, to logic, turns out that uh, the, the encoding is precisely in this fragment. So the synthesis reachability problem for uh, parametric one counter automata would be decidable if that fragment were decidable. So one thing to note is that, in fact, this positive fragment is not a restriction of uh, AER path. And the reason is because you can rewrite negative divisibilities by existentially quantifying the non-zero remainder in Euclidean division. And if you write this down nicely in logic, you'll, you'll realize that what you existentially quantified appears on the right-hand side of divisibilities. So you're still inside AER path. And uh, yeah, quite paradoxically, this was already shown in this paper, which tried to use that logic. Um, so they, they didn't realize that, uh, that this was the case. And the reason that this uh, equivalence is a problem is because AER pad is undecidable. Even with this restricted um, uh, alternation, you can already define the least common multiple. And with the least common multiple, you can define squaring. And from squaring, you get to multiplication, which says that, again, you can encode Hilbert's 10th problem. So this is not the one alternation fragment of that that you want to use because it's undecidable. Um, so we, we're, we're left with this problem, which seems to be open or, or was thought to be closed, but it, in, in reality, it's, it's still open. And uh, there's a very nice solution, which is uh, based on some work by Benedict Bolig and, and uh, co-authors, which I will tell you about now. But uh, bear in mind that this only works for a subclass of the model. So I'll tell you in a moment precisely what the subclass is. It's this OCAPT. 
So for me to tell you about uh, the solution, I have to tell you about alternating two-way automata, which are extremely non-intuitive for me. So I'll do it in steps. Uh, let's start with the non-deterministic BQ automaton. That's uh, this one on the left. Uh, let's say this is the initial state and this word a b omega. So remember that in a non-deterministic BG automaton, you accept if there exists an infinite run such that it's labeled with the word and it visits infinitely often uh, BG states or accepting states. So in this case, we read the first A, we can read the first B and then stay here forever. And this is your accepting run. So this word is definitely in the language of this automaton because there exists an infinite run that visits infinitely many BG states and it's labeled with, uh, with the word. All right, so to make more explicit what just happened here, I'm going to make the non-deterministic explicitly uh, disjunctive non-determinism. So this just means that from Q1, by reading an A, you get the choice of going to Q2 or going to Q3. We already saw that going to Q2 is the right choice if you want to build an accepting run. So again, this automaton is just a different way of writing non-deterministic BQ automaton. So for alternating two-way automata, you also have conjunctive non-determinism. And in this case, when we read the initial A, we don't just have to consider what happens from Q2, but we also have to consider the runs that uh, go from Q3. And from Q3, we see that with B, we, read, uh, we go to Q5, and with B, we can only stay in Q5. So there is this run, which does not visit infinitely many Bichy states, and which is labeled with the, um, with the accepting word. So in fact, we have to consider run trees and one of the branches in this run tree does not visit infinitely often um, accepting, uh, accepting states. So the, the word is not in the language because this is the only run tree for this word. So that's, that's it for the alternation. Now for the two-wayness, which is the less intuitive for me. I don't know why, because for Turing machines, it just makes sense. Uh, what we're going to allow to do uh, is to move the head uh, on of the of the machine on the input word left and right. So if we want to simulate uh, the same machine that we had earlier, every time we read a word, we move to the right. So we read in one direction the word, and this I'm going to denote by putting a plus one. So we read a we read an A, and then we go both to Q2 and Q3, and we go to the. So we started with the head on A. We read it and then we move the head to B. And then we read the B and we go to the next B. And then here we keep reading things and keep moving forwards to the right. Uh, again, by the same argument as before, this will not be, uh, this uh, machine will not accept the same language. But we notice that um, we can change this plus one. So instead of moving forward in the word, we can move backwards. And that will make it so that a run that goes to Q3 reads the A and then moves to B. Uh, when you read the B, you'll move backwards. And then from here, you can again read the A and get to an accepting state where you can read all the Bs that you want. And then you're happy and keep moving to the right. So now this automaton seems to have, uh, seems to accept this language. So this is just an example and for me to work out, to remember the definition actually of uh, alternating to way automaton. So how are we going to use this? Well, it's known that the non-emptiness problem for uh, alternating to way automata is in polynomial space. So we're go going to try and reduce our problem to this problem. So to recall what the original one counter automata problem was, let's start with the model. We have a constraint on the updates. They can only be of the form minus one, zero and plus one. So unary updates, you can have zero tests and you can have parametric uh, tests. So that's all you can have. You cannot have parametric updates in particular. Um, so what we're going to do is just a minor adaptation of a trick by Benedict Bolli, Karin Quas, and Arnaud Saunier, which tells you how to take such a counter automaton and to build an alternating two-way automaton of polynomial size, which accepts words corresponding to valuations of the original automaton that witness that uh, all runs reach the accepting state. So here's the idea. We first have to encode the valuations as parameter words. So we have to define a, a suitable alphabet and a suitable language for, the, for valid valuations. And then for every transition in the original counter automaton, we have to build an A to A, which validates that you 
that you update your counter correctly and that you actually take all of the transitions. Finally, we have to accept if you reach the final state or if the run dies off because we're, we're focusing on infinite runs only. So here's one of the main tricks. How do we encode valuations into words? Uh, so I'm going to have as alphabet uh, this set of uh, variables and also this square, which is go just going to be a, a helper letter, essentially. And my valuation words are going to be such that they start with a square. And then after this initial square, you have a unique position for every variable where you where you occur in the word. So x1 only occurs here, x2 only occurs here. And the way in which I'm going to assign a value to the, um, to the variables occurring in this word is that I'm going to count the number of squares that appear from here to the left, except the first one. So x1 has two squares to its left, and that's going to give you a value of two. x2 has three squares to its left, so that's going to give you a value of three. So that's for valuation words. How are we going to keep the current counter value? Since we have um, the head of the machine, which can be moved left or right, we're going to simulate uh, doing minus and plus by just moving the head in the, to, the, to the left, to the right. And so if the head is here, again, its value is going to be the number of squares that are to the left, including itself. So now you have uh, values for the variables and also the, value, the current value for the counter, which can be kept into the configuration of the A to A. So what are we going to do? We're going to take um, transitions from the original one counter automaton, and we're going to consider two cases. So in this case, we have a transition from Q to Q prime. And since I want all infinite runs to accept, either I have to make sure that um, the transition cannot be taken. So the counter value does not allow you to take this. And then I have to verify that um, taking the transition would just violate the non-negativity, say, or the equality test. Or you can indeed take the transition, but then in that case, I have to verify that the uh, counter update is applied correctly. So they, this is the template for all of the gadgets that we need. And we also had to check that um, if we reach an accepting state, then we, we end the simulation. So here's an example for um, this transition. Q goes to Q prime. And I want to check whether we are equal to X. So I'm instantiating the template that we saw earlier. And here is the simulation branch. So if we do move from Q to Q prime, that must mean that the counter value is equal to X. And then in terms of the um, valuation words that I gave you, if we're at this current position, that should mean that um, if I keep reading to the right, I should find x, the variable x, before I see any other squares. Because if I see any other squares, then the value of x is not the same value as my current counter value that I have encoded using the head. And this is precisely what is happening here. You go to this uh, state where you jump over all of the other variables. And if you do see x, then you accept. Um, conversely, if you, if, you, if you cannot continue simulating, then this is the violation branch. What's going to happen is that you have to see a square before you, before you see x, so you jump over all of the other variables, and then once you see a square, you can accept. So this is how you can encode a equality test, parametric equality test. Um, I won't bore you with decrements, this is slightly simpler. All right, so that's how you simulate all of the individual transitions, but we want to check that all transitions either kill a run or they uh, are taken, if they can be taken, right? Because then we, we want to check that all infinite runs reach the accepting state. And to do so, we take all of the um, A to A's that we uh, constructed per transition. And all we have to do is actually universally branch to all of them so that you consider all possible transitions from all states that are reachable. So the global alternating to way automaton is actually obtained quite easily. Okay, so what did we do? What did we achieve? It turns out that our problem is in polynomial space because we can reduce it to non-emptiness of um, alternating to way automaton. But in fact, you can do better because alternating two way automata can always be turned into non-deterministic Vichy automata, which are exponentially larger. 
and because of our um, encoding of uh, valuation words, this just means that we can obtain an exponential bound on the values of, um, of uh, variables, which suffices for the problem to be, um, to be uh, for the answer to the problem to be yes. So you can guess these values. And once you guess these values, we obtain an SOCA when we replace the, the variables, uh, the values for the variables. And now we have to check the universal reachability problem, which we solved earlier on the previous slide. So this gives us an NP to the Cohen P algorithm. All right, is this uh, clear so far? Okay. So that's the very nice approach, which is um, which is very much due to Benedict Bolick and co-author. So we did um, a minimum delta there uh, by using the universality uh, of this machine slightly differently. But it only works for a subclass because we did not allow for parametric updates. So what can we do for parametric updates? The answer is definitely not partial observation games. And I'll, I'll show you why in a second. So this is what we tried um, to solve the, the general problem. We consider the reduction to partially observable energy games. And these are games played on weighted automata by two players, Eve and Adam. So Eve is essentially going to choose letters. If in this case, she can only choose A. So that enables these two transitions. And then Adam is going to resolve non-determinism. So he's going to say, I don't like this transition. Let's take the one below. What Eve wants to do is to keep the running sums uh, always non-negative and Adam wants to make this eventually uh, negative. And what makes this a partial observation game is that Eve has to choose her actions based not on states, but on colors. So when she plays A and she observes a successor, she doesn't actually know whether it's below or above. She only knows that we get to yellow. So she, had to, she has to choose in the same way from, uh, from both states. And so we, um, we claimed previously that for any um, succinct one counter automata with parameters, so everywhere in the updates and in the tests, you could construct a partial observation energy game in which Eve wins if for all valuations, there exists a reaching run of the automata. So this is not precisely the problem we were shooting for, but uh, it's, it, there's actually an easy reduction between the two. And the idea would be as follows, Adam can choose the valuations and then based on those valuations, Eve is going to simulate the reaching run of the automaton. You can then create gadgets or sub games, which sort of do the same trick as the alternating two way automata. And then using partial observability, Adam can enforce uh, that Eve has to satisfy uh, all of the properties enforced by all of the A two A's that you construct. And then this would give you that uh, the problem is decidable because um, uh, partially observable energy games, uh, in this case, I have fixed an initial value. So it's a particular problem in partially observable energy games. This is known to be decidable and Ackermannian time complete. Unfortunately, and I have already underlined here. So what we observed with Rita um, last week was that if this reduction were to work, because Adam actually is not interested in giving you higher values at any point in time in this game. This would imply that um, for the synthesis reachability problem, you have a positive answer if and only if for the valuation zero, you have a positive answer. For we, and for this, you can clearly construct counterexamples quite easily. So it cannot be the case that this reduction works and uh, that there must be a problem somewhere. So I won't bore you with the details. We have already found the problem, but um, it seems, uh, or it seemed last week, that the problem is still open, maybe decidable. We actually have an alternative approach, which we think gives you, again, decidability and now even complexity results. But um, I'm going to be um, safe here and not say, not claim anything until I have written proofs. So with that, um, let me give you the two main points. If you're interested in parametric one counter automata where the parameters only appear on the tests, then there is this NP to the co NP or equivalently NP to the MP algorithm. And in full generality, the problem seems to be open. Um, I would ask me again in a month to see if it's still open. And that's, um, that's it, unless people have questions. 
Thanks, Guillermo. So it's it's even better uh, instead of presenting like a finished research, you just have presented um, research in progress. Yeah. Um, well, okay, there, there is a finished result, but it's uh, but it's ongoing research. Yeah. Uh, so do, did I understand correctly that you haven't presented any like uh, research which you have finished? Um, let me. Or maybe I misunderstood. No, no, no. So uh, there are minimal modifications. All right. So maybe on this slide, I can summarize. The fact that uh, the previous approach had a problem um, had not been previously formalized. So the authors of the papers had, uh, had, a, had a supposition that this was the case. So we now have a proof that, uh, that, that there's a problem somewhere. Then there's also this, um, this reduction, because although it is based uh, on minimal modifications to this construction by Benedict Bolliger and co-authors, it is still a new result. Um, and uh, yeah, that's those two results. Ah, OK, OK. Mm -hmm. First a question from Philippe. What did you use to weigh in the reduction? So the two weighness is used to encode the current value of the counter. Um, if you, if I show you the template here, um, so the way in which these things, uh, these uh, gadgets work is that you compare the number of the position of the head with the position of the variable you're comparing with, and so they would have, for instance, the same uh, the same value if there there are no squares between them. So the two weightness is a way of encoding the counter value essentially. Mm. Okay, any more questions? So Bless wrote to check on quality. I, I guess this is the right answer, yeah. Mm. Okay, so thanks one more time, Guillermo. Thank you.